<sighs> Good morrow, fellow travellers. Tis I, Robin Hood, dressed in luminous green. And welcome to a review of my gamesake, The Adventures of Robin Hood. A lovely little co-op adventure campaign from Cosmos Games, where two to four players, young or old, don their green garb and have a flutter in Sherwood Forest. Now I may look underdressed, but the good people in costume tell me that a vision of most glorious green is to be projected onto this humble shell. Observe! Much better. It's gonna look good, right? Okay, it's gonna, look, it's gonna look like I'm dressed as Robin Hood. Okay, great, great. Full disclosure here, I know nothing of the Robin's Hood, the Maid Marians, Little or Big John, or Guy Gisborne. That can't be how you say it. But nevertheless, I am determined to provide an informative video review of this weird box. And maybe the first weirdest thing you'll notice about this game is its roster of components. These fellas here with their big wooden tails, a giant tome full of secrets, and most pleasingly of all, a board that's covered in these little doors resembling that of an advent calendar. A strange Christmas tradition where festive children pop chocolates out of tiny cardboard cabinets. And here lies Robin Hood's biggest, most tactile appeal, prizing open these little suckers like a secretive little oyster and seeing all the game goo squirm around underneath. Oh look, here's a guard, here's a man and his horse, here's a wheel. If you're not down with this tactile popping and flipping, well, bad news buddy, because it's about 60% of what makes this game novel, weird and satisfying to touch with your real hands. But that's not all there is to it, so we better get on with the teach, or how the game approaches the teach. One of the first things you'll notice when you open this box is that the game demands you not read any of the rules with the firm yet understandable aggression of a school teacher made of bees. So what you have instead is a game that wants to teach itself to you over multiple doses of rules, like a booster rocket vaccine against misunderstanding. First, you are taught how to move, placing these figures down back to back on the board in a little conga line. How cute! The game then tells you that you can chuck a mysterious white cube into this bag if you don't use your long figure in movement. But why? You will be told in time. And this is the way that Robin Hood passes you from mechanic to mechanic like the MOT from hell. That's a joke for British people who own cars. You're given a thing you can do now, and then you're given a thing that you can do later, but just a tease of that thing, meaning that collectively you're building up this picture of what this game is in your heads over time. But before we get into what this game is, I do want to focus for a second on how this game does do a lovely job of teaching itself to you in a way that is approachable and suitable for younger audiences, which, without burying the lead, is where this game shines. If you're looking for a tactile, relatively simple campaign game to play with family, then this is solid. But if you're after something a little crunchier, a little meatier, a little more interesting, then you should probably give this one a miss. But let's talk about the actual game first. So, by the end of this game's lengthy piecemeal teach, you'll have the following rule set. You start each of these missions with a defined objective. Break a pal out of prison, steal some treasure, stand a green boy antics, you know the drill. And to complete that objective, players are going to take turns pulling discs from this bag, with the colour of disc pulled determining whose turn it is now. Blue disc, blue player. Because a real hero always waits their turn. That player will first move by laying out these wooden pieces in the aforementioned conga line, curving them round trees and skirting the edges of walls, trying their best to stick to the shade where they're safe. If the player then lands on one of these little cardboard doors with a question mark, they'll end their turn by interacting with the world. Most of these have you reading from a certain page in the book, describing what the player has stumbled upon that turn, in a kind of choose-your-adventure style paragraph that gets read to the table. This man with his horse needs aid to get to the castle. The wagon wheel has come off a cart that's stranded nearby. 
a mysterious rune circle has appeared on the ground. But if it's one of these guards you mosey up to, then uh oh, it's time to do punching. And here, the game's combat is as straightforward as anything else in the game. You pull up to three cubes from the bag, and if one of them is white, then you win. But drawing only purple cubes means that you have lost, and the guard wins. But how'd you get those purple cubes? Inside the bag, alongside the player color discs, there are discs in two other colors. A purple disc that will have you adding more of these bad vibe cubes into the bag, as well as a red disc that will, in short, take you into a back alley, undress you, and beat you over the head with a brick. When the red disc is pulled, the game's timer ticks down and the hope in the land falls, with the timer ticking down at double speed if that hope hits zero. But most fiendishly of all, more guards will pop out of the woodwork and existing guards will capture nearby players if they're out in the open, stopping them from moving or being used at all until they wriggle free. But players in the shade, however, are safe. The combat and shade systems here are both perfect from a tactility and design standpoint. The latter clearly divides the board into safe and non-safe regions in a way that is genius for both understanding and not covering the board in ugly line work, whilst the former is a simple probability game that is always tense and tactile. And so those are basically all of the rules for Robin Hood. You're going to be pulling discs from the bag and taking your turn, exploring these tiles and trying to figure out a solution to the objective before the timer ticks down to zero. On the surface, it's a pretty standard premise, but the highlights that set this game apart are all ease of use, functional or exploratory. There are mechanics I've not got into yet. There are joys hidden underneath these flippable tiles, and there's one particular fellow who makes the game far more tense and chunky. But I can't really get into that stuff. It is spoilers. So instead, you're getting the rough idea of what these new mechanics are, which is presents. This game litters itself with joys, with little doors to flip over and new mechanics to uncover, and secrets hidden inside this book that you will be reading from often. Which makes it a crying shame, then, that the writing is not good at all. I mean, it's not offensively bad. It's just so, so plain and flavourless that getting invested in the actual story is kind of impossible. There's only so many times you can hear the same pair of lines. Are you here for objective or are you here for two white cubes? There's an obvious novelty to picking up a book and seeing where the story goes, but it just doesn't really go anywhere in the big picture. It's all quite paint by numbers and standard. But the actual writing might not be my biggest problem with this game. My biggest problem might be how it dovetails into some scenario design that left me wanting more. A good example is in one of the early missions, my group had to get into a castle. So the scenario just ended up being us wandering around asking a load of blokes how to get in. And it was dull. The player who was closest then hopped in, finished the objective, and the mission was over. But often the most damning thing about the scenarios is that one player often has the focus during their given task, while the others just mill around and try and predict roughly where they have to go next, talking to random strangers and getting similar servings of verbal gruel. And sometimes you know exactly what you need to do and where you need to do it, but the game makes you spend ages drawing and resolving these bad vibe discs, turning the game into a sluggish crawl where you're doing tons of admin, short player turns offset by these long rambling paragraphs of flipping these things back over ugh, to restore the game back to its original and replayable state. And that's kind of where my problems lie in Robin Hood, that its premise and tactility offers up an exciting appetizer for a main that isn't really there. The game never really resolves into something ferociously interesting. It's middle of the road in most ways except its presence and tactility. And that's not to say that these problems don't get resolved within the seven mission campaign that the Adventures of Robin Hood offers, but they maybe get resolved 
four or five missions in when the game finally opens up enough to let players have a proper turn structure and know all of the rules in the game. Until then, it's mostly teach. A very solid teach, a very well laid out teach, but a teach that involves a lot of setup, a lot of teardown, and a lot of pretty dry reading. And lastly, I was just left wanting thematically. Robin Hood is a character who has been done, although I have almost no familiarity with how he's been done. I was so ready to be introduced to this land of Robin and the gang, and dismayed to find out that their personalities boil down into draw five cubes instead of three, or go a little bit faster on your turn, which is such a shame. The excellent Unmatched series that Quinns took a look at earlier this year makes Robin Hood seem pretty cool. And there are countless examples of public domain characters or folkloric heroes given a new lease of life through an interesting interpretation. This game's interpretation of Robin Hood just confirmed my preconceived notions about the character. Generic, green, and ready to slip silently out of the cultural landscape. So. All of this sounds awfully negative, which begs the question, why am I reviewing it? To answer that question, let's talk about Hugh Jackman. There's an ongoing, very one-sided debate in my family about the movie The Greatest Showman, a film where Wolverine does a circus, a movie that I think is weird and bad for reasons that are outside of the scope of a board game review. But they love it so much for its simple joys that it's hard to be deeply curmudgeonly about it. Although I do try my best. It's got a surface level bombast that's hard to argue with when everyone's just so pleased. Now, I am not going to tell you that The Adventures of Robin Hood is in any way the greatest showman of board games. It is way too green and brown and beige and aggressively public domain to be anywhere close to that. But there is a connection here, a product that is intensely appealing on the surface in a way that will draw people in that might not have stopped by otherwise. My family really enjoyed this game. They got way more out of it than I did. They wanted to keep playing the campaign when I sort of gave up. And that surface level shininess I talked about earlier, I think that that might spill over into other boxes, tinting their colours a little rosier. Because the truth is that whilst these popping doors suck people in because they're cool and weird and they've got something behind them and isn't it fun to just flip them over, the real joys in this game are in pulling cubes from a bag or gently manipulating the probabilities of turn order. So maybe next time, quacks. Maybe next time, a bit of pandemic. Similarly to Kitchen Rush, a game I reviewed earlier this year, Robin Hood presents a gateway game that gets into the space of what board games can be, but its best parts are what board games already are. And you know, the simplicity of mechanics on offer here does mean that this game will build to a fine point where the most exciting thing around the table is pulling a cube from a bag, yes, in a way that would make Quacks of Quedlinburg proud. And that game is laid on top of a tactile piece of set dressing. The mysteries hidden underneath those planks might be a bit underwhelming, but there's something very satisfying about the big picture slowly being revealed one door at a time. There is juice in this box. There's potential underneath these advent calendar doors. Maybe those scenarios at the end of the game are only interesting because the game takes its time getting there in luring players in who wouldn't stick around otherwise. And sometimes, sometimes that's enough to make you forget that you don't remember a single character's first name. I don't think that The Adventures of Robin Hood is at the top of its class. It definitely has some cool little unique mechanics and interesting hooks here and there that kept me engaged for a bit, but the game isn't really for me. It's not for people who are excited about gouging someone's soda prices or finally building a canal between Belper and Leek. What this game is, is great for families. And I make that recommendation just because I saw how much mine got out of it. Not necessarily as a board game, but just as a box of surprises and a thing to play in an evening. This is a game that has enough game in it to keep it bubbling over, and enough potential to maybe coax them into something a little juicier later on. For the family group, this game surely is a bullseye. And we're gonna put a we're gonna put a bow in post, right?
There'll be a bow. There'll be a bow? Okay, great.